Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries, and we're continuing on with the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. This is part four. Now in Matthew 13, it tells us that there are secrets that are given to God's people. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You know, if you go on and read the scriptures in this particular chapter, you'll find out that Jesus says, at any time they decide they want to understand and then they would be converted. You know, when you're born again, you've been converted. You've been transformed into a children, a child of God. And, um, and so now the secrets are being revealed to you. But everybody is at a different level of understanding these secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Whereas leaven is mostly mentioned in the Bible as sin or something evil, here in Matthew 13, 33, we see Jesus using the word leaven as the kingdom of heaven. Here in Matthew 13, 33, it says, Another parable he spoke to them, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. So we have this, this picture of this term leaven, which we, we can use the word yeast, and it's used in, in dough to make the dough rise and make bread and so forth. There's some interesting things that are being spoken here, even though it's one simple scripture, and it was just a little small parable, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven that a lady put into three measures of meal, and what he's trying to say is that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. There's a whole lot more dough than what there is leaven, but that little bit of leaven will take three measures of meal, which is about the size of a loaf of bread, and it will make that bread rise. And uh, there's a reason behind that, and it's a spiritual secret truth that is hidden in the scripture. And we're going to, we're going to look for it. We're going to try to find it this morning. Here, number one, Leaven causes the dough to, to rise or to be transformed. You know, if you had dough in front of you that didn't have any leaven in it, you can make unleavened bread. And unleavened bread is flat. You might have seen it already. Um, when we do communion, a little wafer that comes with the grape juice says it has no leaven in it. And so they can, they can keep it nice and flat and they can put it into little containers and so forth. Same thing with the festival of unleavened bread, which, to, which begins on Passover and goes for seven days. That particular time, they would have no leaven in their house at all because that leaven was a, was a symbol of sin. And um, in one case, he said, do not, do not follow the, the leaven of the Pharisees. And uh, he was talking about their doctrine. So their doctrine could get inside of a person and cause them to go in the wrong direction and fill them up with all kind of wrong thinking. But the kind of leaven that the Lord was talking about was the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom comes into us and brings the truth that comes in inside of us and that will transform us and cause us to rise up so that people will see us. You see, that little flat le bread, if you lay it on the table, kind of hard to see, but a loaf of bread, you can see that. And that's the idea here is that the Lord wants to bring the kingdom and open it up inside of us and cause, and cause us to rise up, not in pride or be puffed up, but to rise up and make a stand and a witness for Jesus in the kingdom. Well, let's look at some things here in Romans 12, 2. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what he's telling us is that we need to have our minds transformed. You know, the way we were thinking before we got saved was of this world. He said, don't, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. So we were in the world and uh, we were doing all kind of sin and, and just, just living a sinful life. We didn't think about it. We didn't, we didn't think that it was bad or evil, and uh, some people do more sin than other people, but it was still sin. But when you get saved, and that leaven, the kingdom of heaven, comes into our hearts and our minds, it begins to grow. It begins to, to overcome and begins to reveal the evil way of thinking that's in our lives and in our minds. 
And uh, so this is one way in which we become transformed. And once our minds become transformed, we will find out God's will for our life. I would have never known that I was going to be a teacher and a pastor in, in the kingdom of heaven because I was always afraid to talk in front of people. Now I'm bold. I can talk in front of people because the kingdom of heaven is within me. And that's my calling. This is the will of God for my life is to be a pastor, a shepherd, and to help people and guide people. I'm not in this thing for money and, and success and wealth. I'm in it because I want to see people know the truth. I want to see people go to heaven. And that was God's perfect will. He's pleased with that when I yield to him and begin to do those things. So the first transformation needs to happen is transforming of our mind away from this world. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read some rapture scriptures. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be, be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. So what he's saying here, this is what we call the rapture scriptures. They're here in 1 Corinthians 15 and then in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and that one day first the dead in Christ are going to rise you see that's what happens when that leaven comes in it causes the bread to rise and that's the idea that that we have eternal life in our minds see even before that happens and the dead people rise from their graves their bodies rise and the spirit comes back with Jesus and they enter into this new body that's put on incorruption then we are going to be transformed we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye when that last trumpet blows whatever trumpet that is in heaven when it blows and it happens we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye and these in these bodies that are heading for death and they're growing old will be will put on new life we'll have a body like unto Jesus and then we will leave this earth and go live with him forever and then we will um, we come back at one another time and take back this planet in the millennial thousand year reign of Christ but that's not what I'm preaching on this morning. I'm talking about this transforming, this changing of the way we think, this rising up. You know, one day we will rise, you see. First, the dead with the graves, their bodies are going to rise. Then we're going to change and we're going to rise up and meet the Lord in the air. But we have to have that transforming in our thinking. We have to be transformed the way the scripture says, but we will all be transformed. We're going to be changed into everything God wanted us to be in the beginning. Here in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, this is, this is an interesting set of uh, scriptures here. This one scripture is talking about how it's like we're looking into a mirror and we're watching ourselves get transformed. You see, when I, before I was saved, when I looked in that mirror, I saw a sinner. I saw a person that was living in sin. My mind was always on sin, was always thinking about sin and filthy things. But now it's like looking into the mirror and I see that I'm changing, I'm being transformed. You know, when that, when that dough is being kneaded and then they and put that little bit of leaven in, it begins to rise up right in front of their eyes. It begins to be transformed. It starts changing. Because of salvation, when I look in that mirror, I don't see the same person that I was way back when. You know, I got saved in 1980. So when I look in that mirror, I don't see that person that was alive in, in 1979 and, and before that. You know, I, I see this new creation in Christ Jesus. I've been transformed. I've been made into something new. And that's the idea here that we grow from glory to glory. We're going to talk about this a little further at the end of the message about what does that mean to grow from glory to glory. We're going to look at that in the scriptures. But uh, right now we're talking about this unveiled face. What that means is that when Moses came down out of the mountain, he had to put a veil over his face because his face was glowing because he was in the presence of the Lord. But when he came into God's presence, he took the veil off because he was in God's presence. So that's the idea that the scripture is saying right here in Paul's writing that, that you know, 
because we're always in the presence of the Lord, our faces are unveiled. And that glory of God is beginning to shine from us. People know that we're different. Some people don't want anything to do with us because they want to continue to be sinners. But some people like what they see and they want to know why did that happen to us. And then they, they come to Christ. And so that's the idea here in this picture that we are being transformed daily, every day, every moment. We're being changed into His likeness. Here in Galatians 6.15, it says, It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. You know, it doesn't matter about all these outward things. You know, churches are teaching people, and pastors are teaching people to keep the law. They keep the Sabbath, they keep the, the law of tithing, they keep all the laws they, the best they can, and they tell them, oh, you have, to, you have to keep the festivals and everything else. You know, I know what the festival's all about, and I rejoice in them because they pointed to Christ. But I don't have to keep the festivals to be saved. I'm saved by faith and that through grace. And that's what Jesus Christ has come to give me. He's given me salvation because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that transformation is changing me into a new creation. You see, it's not just that I've been changed into a new person. I've become a Christian. But think about creation. That creation has the has with the planet Earth and, and the trees and the animals and they're multiplying and they're growing and the fruit trees are bearing fruit and that's the, what the, the creation does. God put that into the planet. And so now we've been made into a new creation. The kind of stuff we were growing in our personal lives was thorns and thistles. We were growing trees with no fruit. And now because we've become a new creation we're now bearing the fruit of heaven happiness, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. You know, these are, there's nine fruit of the Spirit, and those nine fruit are now coming forth in this new creation. And anyone that wants to know Jesus, they can come to me. They can come to you if you're a born-again believer. And they can eat of that spiritual fruit. That means that they can question you. They can question me. They can ask me about Jesus. And because I'm bearing fruit, in, in um, the kingdom, that now I can give them some fruit. I can answer their questions. I can tell them about salvation. You see, I have become a new creation. I have been transformed. That's what happens to that dough. That dough is transformed and changed and becomes a loaf of bread, something that people can nourish their bodies with. Well, that's how we have become. We've become, Jesus was the bread of life, and now we are like bread of life also. And we just like him, and we bear that fruit. We have food for the hungry, the hungry of those that are in depression and in sickness, and they're in mental depression, mental sickness, and so forth. And we have an answer for them, and his name is Jesus. But they have to connect to Jesus. They have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they can, they can eat of us. You know, I teach in t at a Teen Challenge, which many of them are coming off of drugs and so forth, and they've been in jail, and now they're in Teen Challenge. I go there nine years now and teach them on Wednesdays for an hour, hour and a half, and I, what I do is I answer their questions. So I stand there in the front of the room, and they just raise their hand, and they ask me questions, sometimes more questions than I can answer. Just, they just got full, they're just full of questions. And I come in there, and, I'm, and I can answer their questions. And, and they know that, so they wait for me to come so that they can ask me what questions they have written down since last week and I bring them food food for thought but they have to believe in it and reach for it and they have to begin to ask the Lord for that understanding but that's what we're supposed to do as Christians we have become a new creation you now have fruit and life to give to people all we had to offer people before that was thorns and thistles I could teach somebody how to how to repair an engine or to wire up something electrically or something like that and then they die and go to hell. What good was that? What would it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? But now I can give them the truth about eternal life. I can lead them to the one that can make them into a new creation. People come to me as a pastor and they, they're unsaved and they lie to me. And they tell me stories and lies just so they can either get some money or, or they can try to convince me that they're good people and Christians. But the Spirit of the Lord in me, he looks right through that. So I reach out and I try to help and I try to convince them to tell me the truth, you see, because 
they're going to answer to God for all those lies. But I love them, and I give them what they need, which sometimes it's not food. Sometimes it's a rebuke. Sometimes I have to give them something that's strong and uh, to wake them up. If they don't wake up, well, so be it. That's their, own, that's their own fault. The second point, point of the parable that Jesus spoke was in the mixing. The woman kept mixing until all of the dough was leavened. She, she didn't stop. It's amazing how some Christians just give up. Oh, I just don't understand. Well, you know, when we were growing up and we went into kindergarten and first grade and second, you know, you just you couldn't understand things that people were in fifth grade and sixth grade while you were in first grade. You know, and, and same thing with you know, after you got out of school and then you go get a job and then you talk to some people that have become lawyers and doctors. You don't understand what they're telling you, but you can learn some things. You know, if they learn how to be a doctor, you could learn a medical things. If there was a lawyer, you could learn the law. You see, you're not, as long as you've got intelligence and, and you're capable of learning, you can learn things. But they give up. Oh, I just don't understand that Bible, so they stop reading. And they, and they miss out on great things in the Word of God because they don't understand them. And all they're looking for, just like when Jesus was here, all, he wanted, all they wanted was for Jesus to feed them. But he spoke in parables because he was hoping that would stir them up to want to know, to want to know the truth. And if they just would have wanted to know, he would have converted them. But that's the point of the whole parable was how that leaven, she kept mixing it until it was in the entire piece, uh, lump of dough. Here in 2 Timothy 2.15, the Amplified Bible, it says, Study and do your best to present yourselves to God approved, a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So Paul told Timothy that he needed to study. And he needed to study, he needed to read, he, he needed to talk to other people that had understanding. He had to question them. He had to keep on going. He had to keep going, filling himself up. You see, that's like that lady kneading that dough and putting that leaven in it and kneading it until it started to totally rise. And that was what Paul was saying. You know, he was saying, keep on studying. Keep on learning. Man, you're going to miss out, I'm telling you, on some great things. When you get to heaven, you're going to say, oh, I could have lived that way. I could have been blessed. I, you know, and of course, you're in heaven, so thank you, Jesus, for that. But the idea is that, is that you can have heaven on earth. You can, you can live on this planet, and you can connect with God. And there's some wonderful things that's in the Word of God. It's just a matter of mixing, mixing the Word of truth into our lives by studying and reading and asking questions. Here in Ephesians 5.18 in the Amplified Bible, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly, and, and constantly guided by Him. So the idea here is that, you know, people, are, even though they're Christians, are still leaning upon alcohol. Still leaning upon drugs, they're still leaning upon things to make them happy, and on television, and they're still getting into things they should not be getting into because they're not happy. If they were really truly happy, they wouldn't even need this kind of stuff. But the idea is that the, the transformation that happens inside of us is coming from the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't need these things. What you need is that constant guiding by the Holy Spirit, who's guiding us and leading us into all truth. So you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So she was trying to get that leaven into that whole piece of dough, the Holy Spirit, and, and, and the God's hands, they're trying to, to get that Holy Spirit all into our bodies, into our minds, into our spirit, into our soul. You know, Scripture says, I love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Now that's the wholeness of the dough. So when we get that Holy Spirit all inside of us, we will love the Lord with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, we don't want to leave out one part. So you got to keep on. Keep on reading. Keep on studying. Keep on seeking God with all your heart. 
Keep on looking for Him. Keep on pushing away things in your life. You know, we're not saved by pushing away anything. We're saved by bringing the Lord and, and believing in Him and bringing Him into our lives through faith. Here in Colossians 1.11 it says, We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. So Paul writes to them and to the Colossians and he's telling them that he wants them to be filled with joy. You know, so there's, there's a lot in that, in that leaven to, be, to fill up the dough. And in that spiritual leaven, there's joy, there's happiness, there's peace, there's rest. I mean, y'all need rest this morning, need some peace in your mind. You know, people say, you know, I just don't have any friends and, and uh, people just don't like me. Well, maybe there's something about you that's repelling them. But when you get filled with what he has, yeah, some of those people that were your friends might walk away, but you'll get new friends. When you begin to love other people more than yourself, when you begin to put forth, you know, energy to edify and lift up somebody else and people, people will start coming around. But... Paul wanted them to be filled with power, be strengthened with all his glorious power, to be filled with joy so that we would have endurance in our life, so that we were able to, to run this race in Christianity and not stumble and fall, that we're able to endure, we're able to say no to sin and yes to God because the joy is what we're after. I'm after God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, and so I'm after the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm filled with the Spirit, and so now I expect joy. You see, I'm, I'm to be content in my Christian faith. Are you content in your Christian faith today? Or do you need some things in your life to make you happy? Let me tell you something. If you continue in those things, they, you're going to become bored with them. You're, gonna, you're not going to have that, that true happiness. You know, the true joy of the Lord is there whether you're in prison or whether you live and you don't have any money and you have no means of doing anything to have fun. The joy of the Lord is still right there. I'm content. I don't have to have stuff. You see, I, um, I just have the Lord. And what He has given me I do enjoy, but they are not the center of my joy. Jesus is. Number three, the secret that is in this parable is this. The leaven is doing the work. You know, the dough is there, but the leaven is what's making it rise. So that's the secret. Let's revolve around that. Let's see what that secret's all about. In Philippians 1, 6, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. So he said he's convinced and confident that the work that, that the Lord has begun in us will continue. In other words, the leaven is going to continue to cause you to rise and continue to cause you to be transformed. And then finally, when the Lord comes, we will then be totally transformed into what we are supposed to be. But in the meantime, you're being transformed from glory to glory, from, from level to level. But it's the Lord who's doing the work. You know, if you, try, if you start trying to perfect yourself, you're going to fail. Because it, you don't have the ability to do it. You're just a dough. The dough needs to yield and surrender. If that dough was too hard, how are you going to get that leaven in? You'll have to just throw that dough away and then get a new piece that's, that's able to be, be molded and pressed. And you can get the leaven into you see, so you can't take some old dough and expect to make it into something new. It's got to be changed and transformed into a whole new dough, a whole new creation. You need to be transformed into a new creation, a new, new lump of dough for the Lord to put that leaven inside of and complete that work. Hebrews 13 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here in this scripture, it's saying that yeah, they want the Lord to make you complete in everything, to work um, good work to do his will. So working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Now, that's an interesting thing because it's saying that we don't know how to please the Lord. We don't know how to worship. What does God want? What does he like? You know, uh, without faith, it's, it's impossible to please him, it says in uh, Hebrews 11:6. And so we, we want to have faith because we know that pleases God. So, you see, God is putting inside of us that understanding. You see, before I was saved, I had no clue about Hebrews 11:6, And even after I got saved, I read it, but I still didn't understand what it was saying. So the Holy Spirit had to start showing me that truth inside. And little by little, I started to understand what Hebrews 11:6 was saying. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. I must believe in Him. That's using my faith. Oh, now I get it. All of a sudden, one day, my mind lit up. Where'd that come from? It came from the Holy Spirit revealing that, church, that truth. That he's doing that work inside of me. You see, as that leaven is getting more and more inside that dough, that dough, all of that dough begins to start rising. Well, my mind, my heart, even my physical body, my soul, my spirit begins to get filled with that truth. And all of a sudden, one day, it just kicks in. Oh, man, I've been trying to please him with my works. I've been trying to do good works to please God. And it pleased him. But God loves it when we do good things. But what really makes God happy is when we mix our faith, when we do the things that we do, because we just know by faith that it pleases God. You know, when we believe in God and believe on the words of God. Abraham believed God, and that was counted as righteousness. So when you believe God, you read that word, and you believe it, and you start, oh, I don't believe that's going to happen. Oh, I don't think that's, that's real. Oh, all of that stopped years and years ago. I don't believe it. When you start doing that, you're not pleasing God, because you first have to believe in him and that his word is true. So the Holy Spirit is doing that work inside of us. Lastly, what is our part? What part do we do? If we're the dough... What do we do? Okay? The prepared dough must go into the oven to become bread. The parable is talking about us. We are the dough, and the leaven is Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. We will go into the oven of trials, tests, and tribulations many times. So back at the beginning, I was talking about glory to glory, grow from glory to glory, which is in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This is that picture right here. Every time you go to a new glory, you become a new loaf of bread. New things are now installed in you. In order to get that inside of you, you need to go into the oven again. And then you get cooked again. And get That smell comes out of the oven. Oh, everybody knows the bread's being cooked. You know, and that's what the world needs to smell, that sweet aroma of salvation and grace and mercy and faith and trust, and hope, and I can go on and on. As these things get into us, we've got to go back into the oven so that those new smells come out of your body, come out of your spiritual being. So when you're in contact with people, people start saying, well, that's just a really nice person. That person is just so, so peaceful. I don't understand. How can somebody be so peaceful in a wicked world that we live in? And they don't understand what they're smelling. You know, Jesus, they didn't understand him because he spoke in parables and so forth, but they knew he was powerful. He had the power of God inside of him. And so they came to him, and they knew that he could heal. They knew that he could deliver and set free. But he said one time in John 6, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they all walked away. It was too deep. They didn't understand it. But I understand what it means, but that took me a while to understand what does it mean to eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink His blood? That's the Word of God. That's His truth. To eat it means to digest it. And your body then gets the vitamins out of it and goes into all parts of my body. And I live. Well, my spirit body needs spiritual vitamins, spiritual truth. The more I eat it, the more transformed I become, the more I believe in that Word, the more peace that it brings to my soul. 
So we're going to go through some trials and tests, which is going into the oven. Look what Peter says. He says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. Now, why in the world would somebody be very glad when they're going through fiery trials? It's because of what those fiery trials are doing. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. So be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian, for then the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. So he's talking about to to be in the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. Well, Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. You know, we need to die to ourselves and carry our cross. What does that mean? Well, that means that you've got to live as a Christian. Don't blend in with this world. You know, in, and we need to shine like a light in the dark world that we live in, that the people might see Jesus. So there's going to come a time when you're going to be insulted for being a Christian. And what will you do about that? Verse 15, if you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's lives. In other words, you know, if you're a Christian and you're doing things that are wrong and you get caught, well, that's, that brings a bad name to the Lord. That brings reproach unto the Lord. But verse 16 says, but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time is, has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? What will happen? You know, judgment's beginning with us. God is judging me every day. God is judging you every day. And when he sees something that needs to come out, back in the fire I go. And that fire could be, could be brutal. But in the midst of it, I know what's going on. It's, I don't know how I know it, but I know that he's dealing with something in my life. And I just don't want to give it up. I say yes, but I'm really saying no, don't touch it. I still want that thing in my life. But the Lord's saying it's got to come out. You've got to let me have it. Because I got something better for you. But you'll never, you won't make room. You've got to get that thing out in order for the new thing to be put in. You know, that's, that's the, what we need to understand is that God's trying to get the sin out and the trash out because he's got something holy and righteous to put in its place. And you need to let God have his work in you. So, he, hey, before Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't have to learn things the hard way. Now that he, they brought sin and he, Adam brought sin into the world, we now have to learn everything the hard way. So, you want something good from God? You're going in the fire. I promise you that. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So, if you are suffering in the manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Hey man, been going through anything lately? Has um, life been throwing you a curve? Have you, some people have been through worse things than, than what I've been through, you know, and they have survived it and come through and they still believe in the Lord. Sometimes I wonder, could I go through that and still make a stand for Jesus? Some people lost loved ones because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But yet those people that lost those loved ones are still serving Jesus. I wonder. I've been through some things. I remember a, a bunch of times I, I was ready to walk away. But I couldn't. Because I know my Redeemer lives. I know the joy of true salvation. I know that I have eternal life. I know that God loves me. I know all of this stuff inside. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says that we will not be tested past what we can handle. So the idea is that if, if you're going through something, God knows you can handle it. And it's to bring you to a new place in him, a new glory. So let's pray together. Let's seek God right now. I know some of you are going through some pretty intense stuff. 
And so I want to pray for you this morning. Father, I pray for these, Lord, that are watching, that right now they're going, yeah, I'm going through some hard stuff. And I pray for them, and I, I intercede for them, that every need will be met in their life. They'll be able to rise up over their circumstances. They'll be able to stand for Christ in the midst of the storm, no matter what it might mean. There are some people right now that have done things that are wrong. They're Christians now, but they got a warrant out for their arrest. I feel that in my spirit. You might wind up in jail, and that will be the fire. I know that it will be rough and it will be hard, but the Lord has promised he'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll bring you through and bring you out. And he'll make you into something even better than what you were when you went in. Let God have his way. Let him purge you right now. Let him purge you of all the things that need to come out. Yield to him. Yield and surrender to the hands. Think about those hands from the lady as she was kneading that dough. She was working that leaven. That's God's hands. Working Jesus into all places of that dough. Let him have his way in you. Yield to him and surrender and let him do his, his will upon you. Father, I pray for them now in Jesus' name. Amen.